My past. Hey, everybody. It's over. Of course, you know, I have to start off with some praise and worship music. Mr. William McDowell, I won't go back. His hands up. All right. You know, they funny about us playing some of their music. Um, so they may, you know, it may cut in and out. But I'm only going to play like a minute. So it's 5 o'clock, so I won't even play that. But let's just go through this chorus part right here. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way it used to be. I know that's right. I love me some William McDowell, guys. Hey, everybody! Welcome to Marriage and the Single Lady. I'm your uh, Bible study teacher, Zandra Wilson. I'm so excited, of course, to be here and to continue teaching from restoration. This is a journey of faith in obtaining and restoring godly relationships. This is from my um, um, bestseller on Amazon. So go on Amazon, copy your copy. You can get it free on Amazon Prime, or you can get your copy on Blue Skincare or Amazon, or if you see me in the streets get your copy of restoration so what we're doing is we're going through the entire book so we're now at week 25 husbands love your wives <sighs> you know all of this stuff is just super deep but anyway guys if you like the content of the teaching be sure to like share tell your friends about it invite them to the group let people know we're here every monday at five o'clock from five to five thirty with the mini bible study lesson i do not mind having you guys um i can actually chime you in live if you want to co-teach some of the classes or i can let you teach some of the classes so let me know this is a a, a joint effort in christ as long as god is leading me to um have you on um of course i would love to have you on we the holy spirit dictates this entire platform okay so we're gonna get started we're gonna get started i love 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 being here teaching you guys so tonight's class of course is called husbands love your wives so we're gonna just dive right into it so if you can bow forward of prayer well father god i once again thank you I thank you, thank you, thank you just for allowing me one more opportunity to be able to teach your word, God. I ask that you remove Zandra and just allow the Holy Spirit to rule, rest, and abide in me, God. Just allow your teaching as to how you would want this to be taught to go through, Father God. I ask, Father, that if I say anything in error, Father God, and for whatever reason miss it, that I'm corrected in love, God, that I can go forth and correct whatever is said that's an error. Because, God, the bottom line is that your word is taught. Your word is truth, Father God, and the Bible rules over any other book that we have for this group. So, Lord, although we're teaching through restoration, Father God, the Bible is the primary textbook for this Bible study. For marriage and the single lady. I thank you, Lord. I lift all of this up to you. Father, for all of those who are going to join this live broadcast, I ask that God that their hearts are open to receive your truth, Father. And for those who are going to watch it on repeat, Father, and for those who are on YouTube, Father God, that their hearts are open and their minds are renewed, Father God, from your word and from the lesson tonight. I lift all of these things up to you in the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Amen. So everybody, again, we're teaching from restoration and we're going to just jump right into it. So tonight's class, Husbands Love Your Wives. Now that just seems pretty self-explanatory. It seems pretty obvious. Like, why would you be married if you didn't love your wife? So let's get into see what Paul has to say. We're going to, uh, our lesson tonight has come from Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. 
For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, I don't know if you guys caught this right off the bat. He devoted twice as many words to loving your wives as he has to women respecting their husbands. And we're going to dive into why Paul, you know, wrote it this way. How should a man love his wife? Paul tells us, right, he should be willing to sacrifice everything for her. He should make her well-being of primary importance. He should care for her as he cares for his own body. No wife needs to fear submitting to a man who treats her in this way. We could just stop right there. The issue I know for myself that I've always had with submission is the type of man that I'm submitting to. If I don't respect you, if I don't trust the stuff that you're doing, I don't need to marry you. You kind of know that before you, you know, that's what the dating and the courting phase is for. For you to get to know the brother, right? Or to know the sister is to see, is this someone that I can submit to? So you watch their decision making. You listen to the things that he's saying. You look at his walk with Christ and you look at his walk, period. How he's managing his bills, how he loves his family. from If he has children, his mother, his brothers, how he's handling adversity. All of that is so important to determine if this is a man or woman that you want to be linked with for the rest of your life. And we have to get out of our heads that if this, does, this doesn't work, we can always get a divorce. Paul starts off saying, husbands, love your wives. And we were, I was talking to my niece earlier, and one of the things we were talking about is being second choice to someone. So let's just say if the guy, he really wanted to marry Sheila, but Sheila's married to someone else. So he's like, okay, I guess, you know, um, Kathy, I guess you would just have to do. Don't nobody want to get married like that, right? Like you don't want to marry someone because you're just, because the love of their life is married to someone else. See how screwed up the world has become? And of course, he's not going to tell her that. And also women do it too. Women do it too. We marry someone because the love of our life is not available. And how unfair that is. And unfortunate if you bring children into the world with someone that you have no intentions. You don't love that person, right? So what Paul is saying here, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? Christ died for the church. So brothers, if you won't die for your wife, don't marry her. If you are too much of a coward or a scary cat or don't, she ain't the one. <laughs> And wives or women, if you can't respect him, he's not the one. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how fine he is, how much money he has, how great of a body he has, how much fun you have with him. If those two things are not lined up, no wife will not submit to a man who has her as his priority. The union of husband and wife merges two people in such a way that little can affect one without also affecting the other. Oneness in marriage does not mean losing your individual identity in Christ. Instead, it means caring for your spouse as you care for yourself, learning to anticipate his or her needs. I can only imagine that being a kingdom man in today's society is like swimming against the current as you watch all your brothers floating carelessly down the stream. Because it just seems like it's so hard for everybody. It seems like people want people who don't want them. And the ones who, who want them, they don't want. And we mistreating the ones who love us. It's just a mess out here. And we, we, we're not necessarily praying. I'm a big believer in praying. If you see a brother or a sister that you like, you know what I'm saying? Then you pray and say, Lord, is this someone? You know, let the spirit speak to your heart before you just go right up and just dive into any type of communication or relationships with anybody. We really just don't do that anymore. We just kind of go with the flow. And I know I'm guilty of that. I tend to have relationships with people that I just generally like, right? And I think we all do, but there are some relationships that God may um, ordain us to be a part of that we may be the, we may be the person that's giving. And maybe in that relationship, we're just strictly the giver. There will be other relationships where we're strictly the taker. It just depends on the dynamics of the relationship. And I, an example would be if it's one of my um, young kids, you know, if it's a young, like I have a one guy 
he's a young kid. He, you know, that relationship is strictly me giving. He's asking for advice or he's asking for scriptural verses or he's asking for something, um, you know, uh, about his life. It's strictly that. It's nothing else. So that relationship is completely me, completely giving of myself. I'm not expecting anything from him and he ain't giving nothing. Right. And there's some other relationships where they're strictly pouring into me. So we have to understand the dynamic of the relationships that we're in. Every friendship is not on the same even playing field or relationship. So we need to understand that um, and understanding our, our identity. So again, when you have, when you have a merged, um, when you have a merged couple or anything that's put together, very little is going to affect one without affecting the other. So that's why it's so important that we know who we are aligning ourselves with, that we are who we are merging with, who we are marrying. We need to know the person. We really do. I mean, the issue isn't in the act of love itself. The issue is in the process of producing adequate and continuous love while fighting against the seeds planted in this generation by sexist role models that many men grew up with. What does the Bible say about loving your wife other than literally loving your wife, right? As a man of God, it seems that even the church has an erroneous view about how to love your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church is the proper way, yet very few men understand this concept. You can't put kids before your wife. You can't put your job before your wife. You can't put stuff and things before your wife. That's the improper way to love your wife. We, with religion, most men want to dominate their wife with the word only for their benefit. However, if we are imitating Christ's marriage, we have to remember that he has never treated us in a harsh manner. Where do we get off treating our spouse in such a harsh manner? And that's men and women, because you have some men who are just emotionally abused by the, their wives. But you knew the, how this, this is the thing that gets me. There are so many red flags that's up before we get married. We ignore them, because we really wanted the heart wants what, what the heart wants. Then that's why you're in a, the mess that you're in. You really want God to fix it. Now we're in prayer about this woman or this man when they were, all the signs were there and they were doing half the stuff before you married them. Now you're mad because they haven't changed. How are you going to get mad at somebody that that's how they were when you got them? If he was cheating on you when he got with you, why are you mad at him because he's cheating on you afterwards? We need godly men that know how to love their wives and that are willing to submit to Christ. So sisters and brothers, this lesson is about husbands love your wife. He has to be sold out to God first. You're just going to have trouble. If he's not sold out to God and understanding the, the dynamics of the relationship between Christ and the church and his, his uh, position and all of that, you're going to have problems, man. We need men that are dedicated to building powerful families for the kingdom of God. We need men to open up and be vulnerable with their emotions and tender with their affections toward their wife, their affection toward their wife. But how do we get Mr. Macho to open up to his wife? Now, I've heard a couple of men talk about this, that a lot of times, which I get it, women, I mean, we jump on him if he's confessing something or if he's opening up to us, then we jump on him and we beat him down for it. We call him a punk if he's crying. He's weak. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so you have these men with this, with this air about them that they can't tell you when they're scared or when they are, um, you know, um, unsure. Because we're like, how are you not going to know how, you know, we just mistreat them and make them feel like crap. Now, of course, on the other hand, we don't want a man that's just, he can't make a decision. He can't stand up for us. He's not defending us, right? You, every woman wants to, well, she needs to feel safe. Every woman wants to feel safe. If I feel like I got to jump out there and um, fight because my man not going to do it, or and not necessarily literally, but literally just standing up for his family and his wife and just, a lot of men are just not doing that nowadays. So... Mr. Macho's perception and understanding of his wife must first change. He has to understand that he has to be open. And I understand that it's very difficult for a lot of men. Very, very difficult because of how society has painted you as a punk. 
if you're crying, if you're upset, if you're whatever, I get it. But with your wife, you have to find some type of common ground because you have to be vulnerable with her. I myself am like the typical male. So this is why this lesson is kind of easy for me to teach because I understand it. I have a hard time opening up and being vulnerable. And a lot of it is when I'm vulnerable, I'm taken advantage of. And I know it's not with everyone, but when, when I open up, when I tell you what I want and what I don't want, and you, then you don't do it. So what was the point of me even telling you? Right. Or if I'm vulnerable about something and then you're holding it over my head, stuff like that. That's why people don't open up because people misuse the information that they're given. OK, wives are not maids, inferior or less than men. Most importantly, women are not men and our designs are completely different based on God's purpose. And in my case, it was how I was raised. I was raised with a domineering dad. Right. So. And then on top of my personality, I then followed his leading because I didn't, I wasn't raised in a house where this is how a woman is supposed to act and this is how a man is supposed to act. I followed the dominance of the house. I wasn't taught role playing or role model, so to speak. I just learned by watching. Although men are to be spiritual leaders in the home, men are not better or more loved by God. Yes, man, God created man in his image and women was formed from a rib, right? Before God, men and women are equal. Both genders bear the image of God. The order is designed to build a proper foundation, but not because men are better, smarter, or closer to God than women. Men were created first with the unique role of being a leader in the home. Whew. The famous Bible commentator, Matthew Henry, said the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be, to be beloved. So the bottom line is we're made as a helpmeet. So if I, I need to marry a man that has a purpose, what is your purpose? And I need to know how I fit within your purpose. However, the truth will set you free, and this will help you to build a powerful marriage by God's original design and standards. We need to change the way we view the daughters of God before we can properly love them with agape love. Right now, the TV is teaching your sons and daughters how to love and marriage is supposed to go, and we know that. The younger generation um, are seeing their moms and sisters being abused, and they start to believe that is a norm because the men of God think women are less. You're not fooling God when you say you love your wife, but you tell her to shut up or you ignore her when she is crying or emotional. You can't pretend it's not a problem when you lack empathy and you think emotions are weak. Emotions are not weak. It takes a strong man to share his emotions without the fear of being hurt. The same thing with women. We have to be able to open up to our husbands, right? Um, and not annihilate him or mistreat him or abuse him because he's opening up. Don't let society destroy your marriage. Society teaches men to be sexist, so they will be destined to have destructive relationships. Men don't cry wrong. The most powerful men in the Bible, which is Jesus, David, and, and I should say, um, more Jesus obviously was the most powerful. But we have Jesus, David, and Jacob. They all cried. Jesus wept. Some men believe they are better than women, yet men rant about why they have no control over their families, and that is because they are functioning outside of God's design. It wasn't meant for the man to come in and just rule over and to take control um, of his family per se. He's the head. He's the final say. So he's the one. The the order of his house falls on him. And that's the thing that people, men don't realize nowadays, that how your children act and how your, all your family, all that is, it looks, the eyes are pointing towards you as the head. That's any place though. It's like a CEO of a company. If the company is falling and losing money, the CEO is the first one to go because they're in charge of all of that. They're the overseer. They're the final decision maker. It's the same thing in a house. The husband is the head. The woman is there to help him. He's the one typically with the vision, right? He's the one that's coming in like, babe, this is what God is showing me and telling me to do. If my vision is contradictory to his, then we that's not my husband. And a lot of people, I don't know, um, 
I've had that discussion with a lot of different people and everybody is like, well, as long as you both are in church and you know, my vision is Bible study teaching. My vision is marriage and relationships. If my husband comes along and his vision is uh, missionary work and it's not relationships at all, I have no desire that it's nothing in me that wants to travel all around the world as a, as a, a lifestyle with my family and live in Africa and live in Europe and live in Asia um, to minister the word of God. That's not what God put inside of me. He put that in other people, specifically missionaries. So if my husband, if that's what God put inside of him, that's not my husband. I would not be happy doing that. Even though we're out ministering the word of God, saving souls, that's not where my um, heart lies, right? Um, and as my husband's helped me, that's what kind of like I would be, need to do because I'm there to help him. So I, my husband, my um, desire, my husband would have to be somewhere in the relationship era. You know, that's our, um, the uh, ministry. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Like, we have to be lined up because this is what I do. Live, live, breathe, and sleep. Ministry, dealing with relationships in the family and um, marriage. Submission is seen through scripture. Christ submitted to his father, even though they both were equal, right? To submit in marriage is to follow a husband's authority and voluntarily yield to his leadership. Now we know what Jesus, Jesus could have at any time called down legions of angels when they were um, hanging him from the cross and beating him when they came and got him out of um, the garden of Gethsemane. He could have. He submitted to God. And when he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, he was like, Lord, if this is not to take this cup from me, but if it's not your will, then I, I'm going to do whatever it is you want me to do. Jesus was crying. He was sweating blood. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to go to, you know, it's just that he didn't want to do it, but it was tough. He volunteered to come down here on earth to save foolish us, foolish us, Zandra. Right, but it, it got tough. So he started praying like, Lord, take this cup from me. But hey, it's not my will, but your will. So he submitted unto the Father, you know, because it was tough. All that because he loved us so much. A biblical man would not take advantage of his great responsibility to lead his wife. A godly man will love respect, listen to, protect, support, and lay down his life for his bride. This love resembles the love that Christ has for his bride, which is the church. So when you are a man of God and you love your wife and you know what that, what that is, man, you, you got to love her. And when you love her, you will lay down your life for her. And if you can't lay down your life for her, that's not your wife. Women, if you don't respect that man, that's not your husband. If you can't submit to him, don't marry him. Because he's going to make some decisions he's human that you're not going to be down with. But because he's the head and he's the final decision maker, you're going to have to stand by him and respect that decision. Now, of course, if it's something super crazy, that's when you go to the Lord, because there's so many these marriages out here, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. So I get it. That's when you're living outside the will of God. So for instance, if your husband is a drug addict, um, you know what I'm saying, just something crazy and he wants to take all the money. I mean, of course, common sense, or I should say what wisdom steps in, because now you have a person that has a substance abuse problem, or if he's just making unwise choices with your money, if he has a gambling addiction, things of that nature. But even in that, you have to step back and Father God, how do you want me to handle this? How do you, and some scholars still say, let him, I don't, you know, he's still the head, right? The scripture doesn't say don't follow him when he's a gambling, gambling all the money away, or don't follow him, but we are to use wisdom. It's, it's tricky. I don't even, I don't touch that because... You know, I just don't touch that. My thing is use wisdom. Of course, if the man is gambling all your money away and you're about to lose your house and, you you know, you have two sides to that. Some people just say, you know what? He's responsible for us. If we get put out, this man is responsible for his family. But shoot, it doesn't look like he, he has an addiction. I'm just going by what the word says. This is a man when he, and, I, and life happens, things happen, right? So... Um, that's why you have some women stashing some money away. It's so messed up now. Relationships and marriages are so messed up because when you start bringing in a lot of money or just egos and substance abuse and 
um, addictions and things of that nature. It just overrides common sense. But you know what? The beauty with all of that is the Holy Spirit knows ahead of time. We're just walking all of this out. So he knows that there's going to be a substance abuse issue. He knows that there's going to be a gambling issue. That's why I don't care how fine the guy is, or how pretty she is or whatever. If God is, is telling you no, then you need to listen. If he's telling you to go forth, then he's going to work it out. You just got to pray like what, you know, so that's why you have to have that personal relationship with God to be able to hear him for yourself to know when to go forward and when not to go forward. So are we producing an environment that looks like this or are we demanding respect and submission using God's word to justify an unbiblical way of submission? And a lot of relationships are like that. Christian marriages are ending quicker or as quick as um, secular marriages. There's just no difference. They looking at, the world is looking at us and it's mirroring the world. There's nothing we're doing that's different. There's not, what are we doing that's different? We say we love God. We're going to church every day. You know, some of us every day, every Sunday. What are we doing that's different? The world, they're looking at us and like, why would I follow? <laughs> you... You trifling, you know, they're not trying to listen to us. So that's why our lives have to be different. Our love walk has to be different in the world. And how do we make it different? We can't do anything. Only the Holy Spirit can do the work. That's where we have to step back and just look at the cross and have the Holy Spirit do the work for us because we cannot do it. It's impossible to do, to love someone. We were in Sunday school this past weekend. One of the teachers was talking about how one brother um, had an affair with his brother, with the other brother's wife. So basically, he had two brothers, and one of them slept with the other brother's wife. And so that same brother forgave him and went and took care of him when he got sick. Now, how many of us would do that? It's deep. Okay, so here, the prayer for the week. Father God, I pray that I love my spouse the way you loved the church. I pray for complete surrender to you, oh God, and striving to be a virtuous, virtuous spouse of high moral character. I thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer. So you have to pray this in Jesus' precious name, I do pray. Amen. So pray this prayer for those, if you're married or not married that you can, for men, that you can love your, your wife the way Christ loved the church, and for women, that you can respect your husband so you can have a strong, functioning, healthy marriage. Who wants to be married and your marriage is just unhealthy? And not fun? I don't get it. I just rather be single. I never understood women who just wanted to be married just for the sake of being married. I've been married before, so I can actually really say this and speak on this just get married. It's too hard. It, you're merging two people together with two different thoughts and ideas. And and then, especially with me, because I'm such an a, um, independent thinker and, a, and I have my own life and doing my own thing, to actually come under submission for, for, to come under submission to a man is very, very difficult for someone like me. So that's why for me, I need to, he got to have, if he has his vision and I can see his vision and I can see his purpose, I'll do that with a friend. Like, dude, what, I, you want to help people like that. You want to help people like that. And the money doesn't even matter. I'm not even looking at dollars and cents per se. Because I'm older now, so some, of course that stuff matters. But you, I, I'm looking at your vision and your purpose and how I fit into that vision and your purpose. So I want to be able to love my spouse or respect my spouse which is so important for a personality type such as myself. Respect is way more important than love. Someone like me, you need me to respect you. Something to think about. Husbands, are you willing to give your life for your wife? And wives, do you respect your husband? And if not, why or why not? And if you do, thank God that you do and, and write down, um, well, let me go into the assignment for this week. So this week is the seven-day complaint-free marriage experiment. For the next seven days, refrain from complaining about anything. Write down the areas you want to complain about and then pray about it. So if your husband, you want to complain about him, I don't know, leaving the toothpaste cap off of the toothpaste. 
Don't say a thing. Put the toothpaste cap back on and write it down in your journal for that day and just pray about it. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this, my husband. I thank you, Father God. He's an amazing guy. Father, just start praising him for the positive things about your husband. And Father, and then, Lord, just touch my husband's heart that you can put it on his heart, that he can put the toothpaste cap back on the toothpaste. But don't sweat the small stuff. Don't major on the minors, right? Write down these areas of complaint and pray about them. Don't mention it to your spouse at all. Don't go in there and say, yeah, you left the toothpaste cap off of the toothpaste. I had to go to the Lord and just pray that he just keep reminding you. Don't say anything. Just pray and keep it moving. This challenge will help the two of you focus on the positives in your marriage. So the things each day, if there's something, write it down. Um, if he doesn't do anything that day, then you can think of something in the past that may have annoyed you. Write it down and pray about it. And believe that God hears your prayers and that he's going to answer. And then just thank him for the good things that's going on with your spouse. Just concentrate on the good. Just concentrate on the good. So one of the things I love about marriage and the single lady is that we do try to hit a lot of this stuff before you get married. So ladies, if you've been following us for the last two and a half years, there's no excuse for anyone really to get into, get into a bad marriage because we've hit so many areas from you starting with yourself to then your, you know, uh, your relationship with God. And then before you can even get out into any type of healthy relationship with women or men. And especially if you're going through the year challenge of restoration, if you're going through this book, um, you should be well on your way to having the most amazing, not only marriage, but friendships ever. Oh my God. And this is something you can do once a year. So when you finish the one year, you can start over again. Okay, everybody, that's my lesson. So next week's lesson. Oh, next week. Um, is we're gonna have um, we're gonna start off with um, uh, freeloaders, renters, and buyers with Doctor well not Doctor but with um, Pastor Ricardo Arce from Destined uh, Ministries LA. So I'm gonna be going broadcasting live from Calvary Baptist Church, and they're gonna talk about this ministry. It's an amazing, amazing ministry. What it's we talked about it briefly here once before uh, last year. So we're gonna, I'm going to bring them back on. We're going to just talk about what he's doing, um, how it's going to help you. You know, you can come to the church, I believe, in November. They're going to have like a whole series or something on it. So he's going to talk about it um, um, in detail next week. So that's next week, same time from five. We're probably going to go from five to six next week. So again, join us. I will be here with um, Pastor Ricardo Arce. Okay, everybody. Until then, see you next week. Let me make sure I don't have any questions. Nope, no questions. Okay, bye.